In this video, we work example three um, from our section on increasing and decreasing uh, functions and intervals where functions are increasing or decreasing in the first derivative test. Um, here's our function. It's a uh, y equals x plus two to the one third power or the cube root of x plus two plus four. We wanna find the intervals where the function is increasing and the intervals where the function is decreasing. And then we wanna use the first derivative test to find any relative extrema of the function. We're gonna do the same thing with a different function as well. I'll probably do examples three and four in this video. Just as a reminder, um, we say that a function is increasing on an interval if for any x, um, one x2 on that interval, if x1 is less than x2, then the y value at x1 is less than the y value at x2. So simply when you're going from left to right, the y values go up when we say it's increasing. Now, if the function is, we say formally that the function is decreasing on interval i, if um, for all x1, x2 in that interval, x1 less than x2 means the y value at x1 is greater than the y value at x2. So as you go from left to right, the y values go down. Now, uh, in those cases, when that function is increasing as you go from left to right, all the tangent lines have positive slopes. Um, so that means um, if our function is increasing on that interval, then f prime is positive on that interval. And if our function is decreasing on that integral, or interval, excuse me, all the tangent lines have negative slopes. So uh, the derivative would be negative. So basically, in order to find and those intervals where the function is either increasing or decreasing, of course, we could just look at the graph and like look at where the y values go up, and that those are where the, that those are in the intervals where the function is increasing. But also look at the graph and say, well, where do the y values go down? Those are the intervals where the function is decreasing. Are there any intervals where the y values are constant? Uh, that's where the the derivative would be zero because. Uh, the function value is constant. And um, we could always look at the graph, but if we can't look at the graph, if we have, have the equation of the function, but we don't know what the graph looks like, we can find the intervals where that function is increasing or decreasing by figuring out where f prime is positive or f prime is negative. Now, um, the sort of dividing line between negative numbers and positive numbers is zero. So in order to find those intervals where the function is, or where the derivative is positive or the derivative is negative, we first have to find the critical values of that um, f prime. So we'll find the x values that cause f prime to either be zero or undefined. And that will allow us to define the intervals um, that we test for um, either being positive or negative. Um, okay. And then we, we talked also about the first derivative test. This is in the last video. And basically the first derivative test says that if our function is continuous and a uh, value C is a critical number and it's in the interval I, and remember critical numbers are X values in the domain of F, For which f prime is either zero or f prime is undefined. At each critical number, if f prime changes signs from positive to negative, we're going to be at a relative max. So we go from increasing to decreasing. We might be going from increasing to having a zero slope to decreasing, or we might be going from increasing to have an undefined to having an undefined slope and then to decreasing. But in either case, we get a relative max. Or if f prime changes signs from negative to positive, the function goes from decreasing to having a zero slope to increasing, or it goes from decreasing to having an undefined slope to increasing. But either way, we have a relative min. If f prime doesn't change signs, you might just have a flat spot like this, where the function goes from increasing to having a zero slope to being in increasing again, or it goes from decreasing to having a zero slope to decreasing again. Um, so that's the first derivative test. We're gonna apply that to this function, um, example three, and then we'll probably do the same thing for example four as well. And um, so let's find the intervals where uh, y equals uh, this x plus two uh, raised to the one third plus four is increasing. Well, in order to do that, the first thing that we'll do is we'll compute y prime. Now, the derivative of this term requires the chain rule. So I've got a function nested inside another function. My inside function is that x plus 2. The outside function is that function to the one half or one third power, excuse me. So take the derivative of the outside 
So you say, what's the derivative of the function to the one third? It's one third of the original function um, raised to the one third minus one. One third minus one is one third minus three thirds, or uh, one mi and one third minus three thirds is negative two thirds. So it's that derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside. So you put the inside function back in, you don't do anything to it, you just put it back in, and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And in this case, the derivative of the inside function is one. Okay, so we use the chain rule for that. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, and we add the derivative of four, which is zero. So our derivative is just this one third times x plus two to the negative two thirds. And x plus two to the negative two thirds can be rewritten using this exponent property. x to a negative power is one over x to the same power, but positive. So we've got one third times one divided by x plus two to the two thirds. And those are fractions we can multiply straight across. So we've got one divided by three times x plus two to the two thirds power. Okay, that's our y prime. Now, another thing that we can use um, to make it a little bit easier to understand what this is, is this um, exponent property. Whenever we have a rational exponent, x to the m over n, that's actually a, a radical expression. This number in the denominator corresponds to the index of the root. So if I have x to the m divided by n, that's the nth root of x to the m, or you can take the nth root of x and you raise it to the nth power. Now, when I'm doing calculations with actual numbers, I tend to do this because taking the nth root makes it smaller and then I just raise that number to a power. Um, but when I am rewriting expressions algebraically, I have a tendency to use this one. So when I see this, I see that three in the denominator, that tells me I'm taking a cube root of x plus two quantity squared. So we're gonna write this as one divided by three times the cube root of x plus two squared. Now the question is where is this function positive, negative, or zero? Usually the first thing that we would do is find the critical numbers. So we would find the values of x that cause this to be zero. So we set y equal to zero, or excuse me, set y prime equal to zero and solve for x to find the critical numbers. Usually I write this on the right-hand side. I don't know why I wrote it sort of in line this time. So I've got one divided by the cube root, or divided by three times this expression, equals zero. The question is, is that fraction ever equal to zero? I hope you're saying, no, there's no way in hell that that could ever be zero. And you're right. Um, as x goes to positive infinity, um, this denominator is going to get very large and we'll have one over a very large number, which is a very small number. So in a limiting sense, as x goes to positive infinity, um, our limit is zero. And as x goes to negative infinity, we're going to take a very large negative number, add two, that's still large and negative. We square it. We take the cube root, still large and negative, or excuse me, still large, but now positive because we squared it, right? And so we have one over a very large number. So we're going to get a very small number. So in a limit, in the limit, this function will equal zero, but it's actually never equal to zero. Um, I said that wrong. In the limit, this function approaches zero, but it's never actually equal to zero. So I'm going to just say that this never happens. If you want, and you're like, I'm not sure that that's true. Just multiply both sides by that denominator. And what do you get if you multiply both sides by that denominator? One equals zero, right? <laughs> we have this times the denominator is going to give us a one. And then we have zero times the denominator is going to give us a zero. And you're like, totally never happens, right? This is... <laughs> so that means there are no critical numbers to this function. Oh, actually, just kidding. Uh, there might be a critical numbers, critical number. There are no critical numbers for which y prime equals zero. But we might have a critical number where y prime is undefined. Say, well, actually, that we do have one. 
because I have a fraction here, right? And whenever you have a fraction, that expression will be undefined whenever the denominator is zero. Um, and if the numerator is non-zero and the denominator is zero, that corresponds to a vertical asymptote for that function. So um, I guess I should write this on the side. This sort of instruction should have been on the side. That's normally what I write over here, sorry. So we'll say find any numbers for which y prime is undefined. So you have y prime equals one divided by three times the cube root of x plus two quantity squared. It's undefined when the denominator is zero. You could divide both sides by three. You could rewrite that with rational exponents if you want. You could raise both sides to the three over two power. And I think it's kind of obvious. The only way that that's gonna equal zero is if x plus two equals zero. I could have skipped all those steps and typically I would in class, but sometimes students are like, how do you know that it's x plus two equals zero? Well, remember we're just undoing operations, divide by three, raise both sides to that power. And eventually you have, the only way that could equal zero is if x plus two equals zero. So that means that x plus two or x is equal to negative two. So at y prime is undefined when x is equal to negative two. So x equals negative two is our only critical number. And you have to check. Um, the derivative is undefined there. The you, That value actually has to be in the domain of the original function, and it is. If we substitute negative two here, we've got a zero to the one third, which is zero plus four. So the y value is four there. All right, so we've got one critical number of negative two. The function is defined on all real numbers and y prime is one divided by three times x plus two to the two thirds power. One is always positive, and x plus two to the two thirds is x plus two squared, and then you take the cube root. We're taking the cube root of a positive number, so we always get a positive number, except for when um, x is equal to negative two when we get zero. So y prime is a positive divided by a positive, which is positive on that interval, and then it's a positive divided by a positive there. So it's positive there. Uh, so at x equals negative two, our derivative is undefined, uh, but otherwise the slope is positive. And so our graph is gonna look roughly like this. We know when x is equal to negative two, y is equal to four. And when x equals negative one, we'll have the cube root, this is our function. And we have the cube root of one, uh, which is one, plus four, which is five. And then when x is equal to negative three, we'll have negative three uh, plus two, which is negative one. The cube root of negative one is negative one. So negative one plus four is three. And the cube root graph looks roughly like this. And if we look at that graph, we can see that at this point, at x equals negative two, we've got a vertical tangent line. And that's because the derivative is undefined. We've got one divided by an expression that's approaching zero from the positive side. So the, the derivative is going to positive infinity. So we get this vertical line. And then on this interval, the function is increasing. And on this interval, the function is increasing. So what did the question say? The question said, find the intervals where the function is increasing, find the intervals where the function is decreasing and use the first derivative test to find any relative extrema. Well, um, 
We don't have that in this case. Uh, y is increasing. We'll say, well, y equals f of x is increasing on two intervals. The interval from negative infinity to negative two, just read the number line from left to right. And the interval from negative two to infinity. Y is never decreasing. And the function has no relative extrema because uh, y prime does not change signs. Say y prime, it's f prime of x. And so we've got a function that's increasing and that has zero or an undefined slope and then it's increasing again. And that's like our picture over here. All right. Now we can confirm all of these uh, results graphically. If we um, graph this function on uh, desmos.com and then we can see what it looks like. So there's our function. It is consistent with our picture. x equals negative 2 is actually our tangent line at this location. The derivative is undefined there. If I let this be my y prime, or if I let y equal f of x, excuse me, then uh, f prime of x was something that we computed. It was 1 divided by 3 times the quantity x plus 2 to the two-thirds power. See that derivative? I've got a positive, a very small positive slope until we approach that x equals negative two, and then the slope sort of goes to infinity. And then we've got a, a small positive slope on the other side. Um, but one of the things I want you to notice was we said that y prime was never negative. If we get rid of that, We can see that that derivative graph is always above the x-axis. Um, it just has this like sort of spike at x equals negative two. Um, so the derivative is undefined at that location. Now, if you wanted, you could say, okay, well, what does f prime of x not look like? The various values of x naught. As we go from negative 10 to positive 10, we get all those different values. We could graph the tangent line if we wanted to as well. I always like to graph the tangent line. I have a habit of doing pretty much the same thing in every for every function. I want to make the tangent line white. Let's make that one dotted. Oops. Oops, it should be negative two. So here's our um, tangent line that's vertical right there. But if we move the slider for our x naught, we can watch that tangent line move. See at x equals negative 2, y f prime is undefined, and it won't even graph our tangent line. But at every other value, it'll graph the tangent line. But I think we can see what happens to that slope. Look, that slope is um, almost 1. But then as we, actually, let's, let's make this like a very small interval around negative 2. Let's go from negative 2.5 to 
negative 1.5. And see what's happening to the slope. It doesn't show how how much it's growing. A negative two that is undefined. I think we can see graphically though that if we plot that graph that line, it is actually tangent to the curve at that location. All right. Desmos didn't do what I wanted. <laughs> That's okay though. All right, so let's look at our next example. Also, before we go on to the next example, I just wanted to point out that this is just a transformation of the cube root graph. We've taken the cube root graph and we've shifted it to the um, right, is it right? No, left. Shifted it to the left two units and then we moved it up uh, four units. So that's what this adding to shifted it to the left adding four here, shifted it up. So it's, it's really just that cube root graph, but we've moved it basically. Moved it to the left and then up. Uh, so all of those qualities that we discussed, the fact that the function is increasing all the time, except for where the derivative is undefined and it has a vertical asymptote, those are just characteristics of the cube root graph. So if you understand that's how the cube root graph uh, works, as soon as you see this function, you probably don't even have to do any of these calculations. Um, you know what the graph is going to look like, and you know the intervals where the function is increasing are basically all real numbers. You have to exclude the x value that corresponds to that zero derivative, um, which in this case is x equals negative 2. Um, but the next one, I don't think we actually know what this graph looks like unless we um, compute some limits, we do some graphing. Um, the next one's a rational function, so let's check that out. Okay, so this time we have a rational function. Now we can factor that denominator. It's a difference of squares. Uh, a squared plus b squared factors to a plus b times a minus b. a in this case is x, b is five. So we're gonna have x plus five times x minus five. Now the numerator doesn't factor. It's, well, that's actually x squared. So it's x times x. Um, but it doesn't. the numerator doesn't have any factors in common with the denominator. So since that's the case, the x values that cause the denominator to be zero, um, and where the numerator is non-zero, those correspond to vertical asymptotes of our function. So if we let uh, y equal f of x, I'm just gonna call that f of x now. Um, we'll say f of x has vertical asymptotes, x equals plus or minus five, and those come from having the denominator equal to zero. Oops, and the denominator is zero and the numerator is non-zero. If the numerator is also zero, then we have a hole in the graph. So we would have um, a function whose limit exists at that location, uh, but the, well, Actually, it depends on the multiplicity of the roots. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, so our function has vertical asymptotes at, at x equals plus or minus five, and that's those occur when the denominator is zero and the numerator is non-zero. If the numerator and denominator are zero, you have to simplify first and then look at the resulting function before you can make any decisions whether those x values in the that cause the denominator to be zero correspond to removable discontinuities or um, vertical asymptotes. Um, but this time um, uh, we've got vertical asymptotes because these are both, uh, this is zero when x equals negative five, this is zero when x equals positive five, and in both cases, the numerator is 25. Um, so and we've got vertical asymptotes there. And we also notice the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same. So we have a horizontal asymptote. Um, And that horizontal asymptote corresponds to the ratio of the uh, leading coefficients. So it's y equals one divided by one. You can also prove that, not prove that, uh, compute a limit to show that. If you've got 
x squared divided by x squared minus 25 limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity is an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. So we remember from the first chapter, if we want to get rid of that indeterminate form, we just divide the numerator and denominator by x squared. And that gives us this, the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of 1 divided by 1 minus 25 divided by x squared. So you've got two terms here, you divide each of them by x squared. Well, as x goes to positive or negative infinity, 25 over a really large number is a really small number. So this is going to go to 0. We just end up with 1 over 1, um, which gives us 1. That value is the uh, equation of, or is the right hand side of the equation of the horizontal asymptote. Um, if you memorize the rule that the degrees of the numerator and denominator are the same, therefore the horizontal asymptote is just the ratio of leading coefficients, you can just write that down. But the reason why that is the case is because as x goes to positive or negative infinity, this infinity over infinity indeterminate form can actually be um, adjusted. We can get rid of the indeterminate form by dividing the numerator and denominator by the highest power of x in the denominator, which leads us to this point. We can evaluate the limit and then we get a final uh, finite answer. So we've got a horizontal asymptote. We've got two vertical asymptotes. I don't know exactly what my graph looks like, but I know that it has at least this behavior. x equals negative 5, we've got an asymptote. x equals positive 5, we have an asymptote. y equals 1, we have an asymptote. And if we want, we can evaluate this at 0. When x equals 0, we get 0. So we know that the graph passes through that point. <laughs> so like, OK, we know it's a, it's a um, Rational function is going to have three branches. It's going to have one branch over here where x is less than negative 5. It's going to have a branch in between negative 5 and 5. And then it's going to have a branch uh, to the right of x equals 5. And then we know in this branch, as x goes to negative infinity, it has to approach y equals 1. In this branch, as x goes to positive infinity, it has to approach y equals 1. And if we wanted to, we could find the limit as x approaches positive and negative 5 from the left and right to find out what the behavior is on either side. Like then we might go to positive infinity on one side, negative infinity on the other side for each of these lines. Um, but no, we don't actually have to do that. OK, so the question said, find the intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing, and then use the first derivative test to find any relative extrema. So we were able to find the asymptotes first. Um, and that actually helps us with the domain. The domain is all real numbers except for x equals plus or minus 5. Um, and now we need to find uh, the function or the, the intervals where fun the function is increasing. So we'll compute y prime or f prime of x. I'm not sure what you guys prefer. So that's the derivative with respect to x of our quotient. So we'll use the quotient rule. Quotient rule says if this is the uh, low function, and this is the high function. And I know that that's not how we spell low and high. Uh, the derivative of high divided by low is low d high minus high d low over low low. And that d is an operator, it applies to what's in front of it. So you're taking the derivative of the high function and the derivative of the low function here. So when I, I think of this and I see this, I say, what's the derivative of this quotient? It's low, so the bottom function. d high, derivative of x squared is 2x, minus high, which is x squared, uh, d low, the derivative of x squared minus 25 is 2x minus 0, which is just 2x, all divided by low low. So we have, if we simplify, uh, 2x times x squared is uh, 2x cubed minus 50x uh, for our second term. We have 2x cubed there, and then we have negative 25 times 2x is the minus 50x. And then the 2x times the x squared here is a negative 
Well, that's going to be a 2x cubed when we're subtracting. And this is x plus 5 times x minus 5. But we're squaring both of those factors. So I'm factoring this, and then I'm saying, well, a times b quantity squared is a squared times b squared. And these guys reduce. And so we have negative 50x all divided by something that's definitely positive, except for when it's undefined, right? Or except for when it's zero. All right, so that's our y prime. And in order to find uh, the signs of y prime on the intervals of interest, we list our um, x values corresponding to the vertical asymptotes here, and then any x values uh, that correspond to critical numbers as well. And then we find the sign of y prime on each of the intervals defined by that. So I think I got a little bit ahead of myself. I computed y prime. Let's write down the steps. And then after you compute y prime, find the critical numbers. So we'll say y prime is undefined when the denominator is uh, zero and the numerator is not zero. Well, it's actually going to be uh, whenever the uh, denominator is zero, just in general. Um, so this is undefined when x equals plus or minus five. Because this factor is zero and x equals negative five, this factor is zero and x equals five. Y prime equals zero when that fraction equals zero. And a fraction equals zero when its numerator equals zero. Or you can alternatively multiply both sides by this, and you'll just get the numerator equals zero times that. So. And if negative 50x equals zero, that means x equals zero. So here are our, or here is our critical number. Of y equals f of x. These two would be critical numbers if um, the function was defined there. And since they are not in the domain, they're technically not critical numbers, but we need to include those values on the number line to define our intervals. So um, let's write that down. Uh, let's say sketch a number line with critical numbers and any x values, well, let's say any um, x values corresponding to vertical asymptotes. It's an important uh, fact. We've got zero, negative five, and five. And now you've got four intervals, the interval from negative infinity to negative five, negative five to zero, zero to five, and then five to infinity. And y prime is negative 50x um, divided by something that is always positive except for when it's zero. So these guys are zero at x equals plus or minus five, but they're positive the rest of the time. So it's a positive on all four intervals. When x is positive, negative 50x is negative. So it'll be negative here. And then when x is negative, we'll have a negative times a negative, which will be positive. So y prime is a positive times a positive here, which is positive on that interval. That's a positive times a positive here, which is positive on that interval. Negative times a positive is negative, and negative times a positive is negative. So this is what we've got. Now, you have to remember these are not flat spots. We talked about the flat spots in a another video, right? We said if y prime does not change signs, then f of c is neither a min nor a max. The derivative is zero there. We might just get a little flat spot. But in this case, uh, y prime doesn't change signs, but it doesn't change uh, 
But what's happening at x equals plus or minus five is that we have a vertical asymptote. So we actually had to remember that from our chapter on limits um, in order to sort of interpret this sign chart correctly. So you know the function's increasing on this interval, it's increasing here and then decreasing, and it has a zero slope at zero. So the function's increasing and then it has a zero slope and then it's decreasing. So we've got a relative max at zero. And then on this um, interval, it's decreasing. So it's increasing here. I'm gonna expect it to look like that. If it's decreasing there, I'm gonna expect it to look like that. And then here it's going from increasing, to having a zero slope to decreasing. So I would expect the graph to look like that. So, okay, what was the question? It said, find the intervals where the function is increasing, find the intervals where the function is decreasing, and then use the first derivative test to find any relative extrema. So we've already used the first derivative test, um, but let's let's make sure we answer that those other questions first. Where is the function increasing? Well, it's increasing on this interval and this interval. So that's negative infinity to negative five. Just read the number line from left to right, and then negative five to zero. And it's decreasing whenever y prime is negative. So on zero to infinity, or zero to five, excuse me, and uh, five to infinity. So decreasing here and here, increasing here and here. So again, we make our sign chart by sketching. Uh, listing any critical numbers and any of x values that correspond to vertical asymptotes. Um, then we list the factors of y prime here. And if you have a quotient, you know, your factors in the numerator or denominator. And then you find the sign of each factor on each interval, and you multiply those signs to find the sign of y prime. And I didn't write all of that down, but that's the idea. That allows us to determine the intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. And then by the first derivative test, our function, our derivative changes sign at, signs at x equals zero, and we know it has a zero slope there because uh, y prime was zero when x equals zero. So it's gonna look like that. Um, so we'll say since y prime uh, changes from positive to negative at x equals zero, y equals f of zero, which happens to be zero, is a relative max. All right. So I know I have a relative max here, and I know my function is supposed to be increasing on this interval and then decreasing, or increasing on this interval and increasing on this interval then decreasing on this interval, and then decreasing on this interval. And we know that the function is supposed to approach y equals one. I'm pretty sure the graph is gonna look like this. Because as x goes to positive or negative infinity, the y values are supposed to approach one. As we approach x equals negative five from the left or right, I'm expecting infinite uh, limits, positive or negative. We can think about what happens as x gets very close to negative five from the left or the right by plugging in, say, negative 5.00001 or negative 4.99999 and doing something similar here. But because of the test that we already did, we know that this is the behavior and we know sort of the expected behavior here and since I'm just looking at this, I can see, well, I'm probably going to go to positive infinity on this side and negative infinity on that side, negative infinity on uh, to the left of five and positive infinity to the right of five. Uh, so let's go to Desmos and see if we're right, see if that's what the graph actually looks like. And so we were right. This is what the graph looks like. Um, we've got uh, y equals x squared divided by the quantity x squared uh, minus 25. So we've got those vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 5 and 5. Um, we computed f prime. We said the numerator was negative 50x. The denominator was that x plus 5 quantity squared times x minus 5 quantity squared. 
So the denominator, excuse me, is always positive. And if I include this negative in the numerator, that numerator um, actually goes from and positive when x is negative, because we're gonna have a negative times a negative, which is a positive to the right of zero. So the function should be increasing uh, when x is less than zero, and it is, it's increasing on this interval and increasing on this interval. And then um, when x is positive, negative 50 x is negative. So we've got a negative divided by something positive, which is negative. So the function should be decreasing when x is greater than zero. So it's decreasing there and then decreasing there. And then we said at the beginning, um, as x goes to plus or minus infinity, the y values approach one, and we see that the graph does get very, very close to that horizontal line, y equals one. Um, so I think we've done everything correctly. Now, another way that you can do this, if you're trying to infer the signs of f prime, is to just look at the graph of f prime. So I'm going to get rid of the graph of f now and just look at the graph of f prime and see what we see. Well, f prime is undefined at x equals plus or minus five. So it has vertical asymptotes at plus, plus and minus five as well, but it does not have this horizontal asymptote. Um, f prime's horizontal asymptote um, is y equals zero. And um, see that function gets very, very close to y equals zero as x goes to infinity. You might say, how do I know that so easily? It's because the degree of the numerator is just one and the degree of the denominator is four. So as X goes to positive infinity, um, the uh, we end up with a negative infinity over infinity in determinate form. But when we divide both uh, the numerator and denominator by X, we end up with a, a numerator, which is negative 50 over a cubic polynomial. Um, so that as x goes to positive or negative infinity, that cubic expression is going to go to positive or negative infinity. So we end up with a negative divided by something that's large and positive or large and negative. And so that fraction is going to approach zero as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So that's what we've got there. I mean, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but so this is what um, f prime looks like. And you say, how, how does that help us? Well, you can see that f prime, that's the derivative, is positive um, from negative infinity to negative five and positive from negative five to zero. So that means I expect my original function to be increasing on those intervals. And then my f prime is zero at x equals zero. Um, and then f prime is negative when x is on the interval from zero to five and then negative on the, when x is on the interval from five to infinity. So I'd expect the original function to be decreasing. Now, since f prime goes from positive to zero to negative at x equals zero, and my graph is going to go from increasing to having a zero slope to decreasing, so I'm going to expect a relative max there. And if I graph them both at the same time, I can see that um, this function, the orange function is increasing when the derivative values are positive. The orange function is increasing when the derivative values are positive. The orange function is decreasing when the derivative values are negative. The orange function is decreasing when the derivative values are negative. And when the derivative goes from positive to zero to negative, the original function goes from increasing to having a zero slope to decreasing. So if we wanted to, rather than making our sign chart, we could look at the graph of f prime and use, f, uh, use the graph to make our sign chart. We could say um, f prime is positive here, positive here, zero here, negative here and negative here. And then we would be able to use that to infer that the original graph looks like this. Um, I prefer just making the sign chart, uh, but if you read the graph, it's gonna give you the same information. That's actually an excellent quiz question. So if I ever gave you the graph and I said, make, made a, make a sign chart for um, F prime and then use that sign chart to infer the graph of the original function, you could do that. That would show that you really understand the concepts. But that's our original function. That's what it looks like. Um, and I think that's it for right now. I'm trying to think, oh, let's do a trig function before we go. Okay, same question, a new function, but we've got a trig function this time. So the question says, find the intervals where the function's increasing, decreasing, and then also use the first derivative test to find any relative extrema. 
Um, well, in order to do that, we need to compute y prime. If y prime, or if y is sine of x plus cosine of x, well, y prime is the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x, plus the derivative of cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. You might say, okay, I find the intervals where f is increasing or decreasing. That requires setting y prime equal to zero and then solving for x. So y prime equals zero when cosine of x minus sine of x equals zero. That means that cosine of x is equal to sine of x. And where is cosine of x equal to sine of x? Well, a couple of times, right? If I am drawing triangles in the xy plane, cosine and sine are the same whenever our angle is that 45 degree angle, right? Because we've got a one, one square root of two uh, triangle there. And so uh, this is uh, cosine of x is equal to sine of x when x equals uh, pi over four. And say, is there any other time when x, uh, cosine of x and sine of x are, are equal to each other? I think down here as well, when x and y are both negative, and we've got a 45 degree angle there. So it's going to be 180 plus 45 or pi plus pi over four, which is uh, five pi over four. And then we can add or subtract two pi as many times as we want. So we'll say plus two pi n, where n is an integer. Alternatively, you could just say, you can add pi as many times as you want. <laughs> um, you can just start with pi over four and then just keep adding pi because I go from here, add pi, I'm here, add pi, I'm here, add pi, I'm here. Or alternatively, you could divide both sides by cosine and then you would have a one equals tangent of x. So x equals pi over four plus n pi where n is an integer. I like this last version because it's more succinct. Um, so these are the critical values of uh, our function. Critical values are critical numbers. And we also have to think about any uh, values of x where y prime is undefined. Well, y prime is well-defined all the time because cosine's uh, domain is all real numbers and sine's domain is all real numbers. So we'll say y prime is always well-defined. So not only are these critical values of uh, y, they are the only critical values of y. So let's write down what we did. So we computed y prime, we set y prime equal to zero, we solved for x, and then we thought about when y prime was un undefined, those are critical numbers too. In this case, we only had those x values that correspond to the derivative being zero. And now we're going to use those to determine um, when our function um, is increasing or decreasing. Now, I don't have factors this time, I just have y prime equals cosine of x minus sine of x. So I might, um, just have to use some test values. So I've got a number line, and we know that at pi over four, we've got a critical value, and at five pi over four, we have a critical value. And then we'll have at um, nine pi over four, we'll have a critical value, and then 13 pi over four, we have a critical value. And those continue in both directions, negative three pi over four, we have a critical value. Um, so if we find that pattern on the interval from, uh, let's say, 0 to 2 pi, so like somewhere in here to here, uh, then we know that that pattern is going to repeat. So y prime is uh, cosine of x minus sine of x, and y prime only changes signs at these x values. So you'd say, okay, well, how can I find the sine of y prime in each of these intervals? Well, you just pick a value. Um, in that interval. So if I'm on this interval from negative three pi over four to pi over four, I can just choose um, 
that the zero value. So y prime um, x equals zero is on that interval. When we evaluate this expression at zero, we have cosine of zero, which is one, minus sine of zero, which is zero, so that's one. And that's a positive number. So we're gonna have a positive number there. Then from pi over four to five pi over four, a number on the that interval is pi. So I have cosine of pi minus sine of pi. Sine of pi is zero and cosine of pi is negative one. So we get a negative. And then from five pi over four to nine pi over four, uh, two pi is on that interval. So we're gonna have cosine of two pi minus sine of two pi, which is just one minus zero again. So we get one, which is positive. And we see that we're just gonna have that repetition because we have zero here and then pi here and then two pi here and then three pi here. And so our test value is always going to be that multiple of pi. And if we keep plugging in those multiples of pi, pi we're gonna get one, negative one, one, negative one. And so this sign is gonna go from a positive on this interval to negative on this interval, positive on this interval, to negative on the next interval. And again, the intervals are defined by those critical values. So I'm talking about the interval from here to here. That red value that I marked on the number line is just a test value. It's just an X value from the interval that we're plugging into our function. So it looks like our function is increasing, then decreasing, then increasing, and then decreasing. And the pattern continues. So the original function was y equals um, sine of x plus cosine of x. And at pi over four, we're gonna have sine of pi over four plus cosine of pi over four. So that's a uh, square root of two over two plus square root of two over two, which is square root of two. And then at five pi over four, our sine and cosine are both negative, right? because we're in quadrant three. So we're gonna get negative square root of two over two and negative square root of two over two. When we subtract those, we get negative square root of two. And I don't remember what that value is, uh, but that pattern's going to keep repeating. We're gonna see the same thing at nine pi over four that we saw at pi over four because sine and cosine both have a period of two pi. Um, so our graph is gonna look like this. When x equals zero, we, we get sine of zero, which is zero, plus cosine of zero, which is one. And then at pi over four, let's say pi over four, um, hmm. Is it pi, pi over four? And then we'll say five pi over four is right here. Is that right? Pi over four, two pi over four, three pi over four, four pi over four, which is pi, five pi over four, and so on. At pi over four, we get square root of two. And at five pi over four, we get negative square root of two. Oops, I just lost one of my earbuds. I really need a calculator to approximate these numbers. Let's, let's actually do the graph on decimals. And so this is our function, y equals sine of x plus cosine of x. And I plotted the points at pi over four and five pi over four. So that um, square root of two is approximately that 1.414. So it looks like we've got, it looks a lot like just a shifted sine function and it looks like the maximum value is square root of two and the minimum value is negative square root of two. I wonder what that value is. <laughs>
negative 0 0.81. So it looks like, well, a, shift, a shifted sine function is the same as a shifted cosine function as well. You can think of it either way. Uh, but actually, let's approximate pi over 4. I'm curious. I think... Yep, that root is at, at negative pi over four zero. That's right. Um, so we've got a, a function that has roots at negative pi over four, three pi over four, seven pi over four, 11 pi over four. And we can see that from the graph and that it has minima and maxima at um, this pi over four plus pi. So we have pi over four, five pi over four, uh, 9 pi over 4, 13 pi over 4, and so on. You might say, how could I have figured that out without this calculator? Well, let's look at our paper. We kind of cheated, didn't we? We looked at the calculator first. Okay, so we said um, y is equal to sine of x plus cosine of x, and we know that when we substitute x equals 0, it's sine of 0 plus cosine of 0 which is just zero plus one, which is one. So we know that. And then if we want, that, that's our y-intercept. To find all of our x-intercepts, we set y equal to zero. And then we solve for x. Well, if we're setting y equal to zero, that means that sine of x is equal to negative cosine of x, or alternatively, um, tangent of x is equal to negative one. Now we know that tangent was positive one whenever we had that 45, 45, 90 uh, triangle in quadrants one or three, but it'll be called negative one whenever we have that 45, 45, 90 triangle in quadrants uh, two or four. So here the X value is negative and the Y value is positive. And here the Y value is negative and the X value is positive. Um, so in that case, this equation has solutions well, this is pi over four here, and so this angle is three pi over four. And then this is three pi over four plus an extra pi to get us down there. And so um, our y values will be zero at um, three pi over four plus n pi, where n is an integer. So the first time that it's uh, zero um, is at when n is equal to say negative one would be at negative pi over four. And then when n is zero, it'll be zero again at um, uh, three pi over four. And then if we add pi again, it'll be zero again at seven pi over four. And so on. So it just keeps repeating like that. And then uh, this square root of two is approximately 1.4. So here's two and square root of two is somewhere in here. Um, at pi over four, our function value is square root of two. And at five pi over four, our function value is negative square root of two. So there's negative one, there's negative two and negative square root of two is approximately right there. So there's one period of that wave, and then it continues in both directions. So the question said, well, when is the function increasing? When is it decreasing? Well, according to this, it was increasing here, and then it had a zero slope, and then it was decreasing. And then it had a zero slope, and then it was increasing. And then it had a zero slope, and then it was decreasing. And then I had a zero slope and then it was increasing again. And it just continues like that. And that's what we see. So we can say it's increasing on this interval. And on this interval. And then decreasing in between. And the endpoints actually matter a lot. Um, so the 
the next maximum here will occur at uh, 9 pi over 4, right? And the next minimum here should occur at negative 3 pi over 4. All right, so that's our function. So y equals cosine of x plus sine of x has um, relative maxima of square root of 2 at um, pi over 4 and then 9 pi over 4 and uh, 2 pi after that as well. So at x equals pi over 4 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer, our function has a relative minima, a relative minimum value, excuse me, of square root of 2 at many x values, including at 5 pi over 4. And then it repeats every 2 pi n after that, where n is an integer. And that's by the first derivative test because the derivative is changing from positive to having a zero slope to negative. So it's increasing that it has a zero slope and then it's decreasing. Then it's decreasing, it has a zero slope and then it's increasing. Then it's increasing, it has a zero slope and then it's decreasing. Decreasing has a zero slope and then it's increasing again and so on. So this is by the first derivative test. And the intervals where that function is increasing and decreasing are these intervals here. So we'll say, um, hmm, how do I say it? Like, how do we make sure that that notation is correct? Because it's alternating on every other interval. And it really just depends on whether we're starting with a multiple of or if we're starting with pi over 4 plus 2 pi, or if we're starting with pi over 4 plus pi. So we say, OK, um, y is decreasing on intervals of this form at pi over 4 plus And 2 pi n to uh, 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. And then y is increasing on 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n to 9 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. So I think we answered the questions. That's where it's increasing and decreasing. That's where we have relative extrema. Now, just from looking at this graph, what it looks like to me is a sine curve. Um, it starts at negative pi over 4 and ends at 7 pi over 4, so the period is 2 pi, um, but the amplitude is square root of 2. So I'm going to say it looks like, this is just an observation, y equals cosine of x plus sine of x might be equal to y equals the square root of 2 times sine of x, but then the graph has been shifted pi over four units uh, to the left. So that means we would add pi over four to the x values. So this was our answer to the question. We made an observation. We said, hey, isn't that the same as this? Let's look at that on desmos.com and see if we're right. So that was the original function.
And I said, well, I think that that's square root of two times sine of X, but we have to shift it pi over four units to the left. So I'm gonna add pi over four. Look, they're the same thing. So this function that we started with happens to be the same as this function. I think that's kind of cool. All right, I think that's it for the first derivative test in intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. Turns out that we can also find a relative extrema using the second derivative. Um, turns out that if the second derivative has a particular sign, then we know that those critical values correspond to relative mins or relative maxes as well. Um, so that'll be discussed in the next video.